now that we've celebrated Easter, one of the things that we struggle with in American Christianity, and especially in Protestantism, is that Easter has become a day for us. Easter in the early church was a season where you celebrated Easter, you focused on Easter, you taught about the resurrection from the day of the resurrection until the day of Pentecost, 50 days later. Now, many of us have bought into what Walmart has done, and the moment Easter is over, all the candies on half price, and a whole new setup is going on for whatever the next holiday is. Because what we've done in, in American Christianity sometimes is we've bought into the way the society treats Christian holidays. And so we compartmentalize. The moment this day is over, it's done. I can put it out of my mind. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to reflect on it. I don't have to let it change my life. The moment Christmas is done, what does Walmart do? Put out stuff. For New Year's. What's more important? The birth of Jesus Christ or a calendar change? What we should be doing is have Christmas celebrated till Easter, Easter celebrated to Pentecost, and Pentecost celebrated to Christmas. That's what we should be doing. We have to figure out how do we live out Easter on a daily basis. Not just one day a year, but how do we live it out every single day of our life? How do we live out the reality of a resurrected Savior on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday? How do we live it out in December? How do we live it out in July? How do we live it out every day? Resurrection Sunday, which sometimes you might hear Easter called Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection Sunday is not just an event. It is a call to be closer to God. Closer to the risen King. And one of the things that Jesus did with his disciples to invite them to get closer to him was a foot washing ceremony. The night that the crucifixion and trial and all of that started. This is a passage that's unusual for us. And the reason why it's unusual is because we live in a very different cultural context than what they did at the time. And so you can read this and Jesus says to Peter, if you do not let me wash your feet, you have no part of me. Which makes it sound like, Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet in this physical act, you're going to go to hell. And sometimes we, we keep reading the scripture, it says, what I have done, you have to do with each other. So does that mean that if you have never let your feet be washed, you're not going to go to heaven? Because scripture says, unless you do this, you have no part of me. Feet washing was one of the most socially unacceptable and low-class things that a person could do in society. I mean, Jesus uh, did this example. This is not something that everybody is going to be lining up to do. Think about the way that, that the society was at the time. The reason why feet washing was disgusting is because people's feet were disgusting. Unlike today, people walked around either barefoot, because many people were just in abject poverty, they either walked around in bare feet or they walked around in sandals. And so imagine that you're walking around a hot desert all day. You probably smell like roses. You feel like you just hung out in a cooler. One of the worst jobs I ever had was working at an ice packing place and you went into this uh, you went into a, a freezer about as big as this room and you packed bags of ice for three hours and then you spent the next 10 hours delivering it all which is wonderful uh, so I quit after two weeks um, but I'm sure that we that if you were walking around the hot desert all day you would feel like you were just sitting in this nice 
humongous cooler. No, that's not the way it was. The sweat rolling down your legs, dripping on your feet, mixing with the dust and the dirt as you are traveling along, mostly un, uh, places with no trails, places with no paths, places with no roads. And if you were walking on a road, it's not a road like we have, it's a, it's a dirt road. And most of these places, so you're just walking around sweating and dust and dirt is everywhere. The roads would be covered in the filth and excrement of all the livestock and horses that were going by. Which means you are walking in the filth and the excrement. No matter how much care you took, your feet were going to be disgusting. And if you're in a city, there's no such thing as a septic tank or a sewer. Taverns and houses will be dumping out bedchambers and everything else literally in the street. Anybody wonder why the life expectancy was like 42? It's disgusting. And you're walking around in this all day which if you've ever seen a movie depicting ancient times do you wonder why the royalty was sitting in these carriages that were carried by four slaves <laughs> because if you don't value humans the people that you think are less than you you're going to make them carry you so you don't have to get your feet all disgusting that's really the way it was so the job of foot washing was relegated to servants and the servants in this day and age were usually either slaves or Low-class individuals who had taken on a debt or, or just done something like that, and they had to put themselves in indentured servitude for a number of years to pay off their debt. That's usually the way that it was. So the people that were treated as disposable property, the people that were treated in society like they had no value, these were the people who had the job of washing the dirt and the grime off of people's feet when they came into the business or the home. That's why Jesus rebukes the Pharisee who invites him into his home and doesn't even offer someone to wash Jesus' feet. And instead, this woman, who was so moved by her own sins, washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. That is the act of humility that this woman took on. So the person that would usually do this is going to be somebody that has absolutely no value. You don't take the prince. You don't take the son of the house. You don't take anybody like that and get them to wash it. You take the person that you don't care if they live or die or anything else because you can go buy another slave tomorrow. And Jesus takes his disciples' feet. washes them. The Son of God. The Son of God Most High. The living embodiment of the sovereign, eternal, one true God puts himself in the position of a disposable servant. He lowers himself to the point where he is part of the underclass of society. He lowers himself to the, to the uh, undervalued of the undervalued. He, the king of heaven picks up his disciples' feet, washes them with his hands, and dries the feet of those who should be his servants. Do you understand what an act of love this is? It's hard to imagine. Because sometimes we forget that Jesus is not just the lowly servant. He is the king of heaven. We wouldn't be able to easily imagine 
the President of the United States, because they've all been the most humble people around at the time, right? Carrying their own luggage. Could you? Could you imagine President Bush or Obama washing the Secret Service's laundry? What kind of God puts himself in such a lowly position for other people? So in this scripture, Jesus uses the firsthand example of foot washing to teach us a critical message. We need to go back to where Jesus says, With, Unless you let me do this, you have no part of me. That's a pretty serious thing Jesus is laying down. If you don't let me do this, you're not going to be a part of me. You're not going to go to heaven. You're not going to have a relationship with me. You're not going to be part of my eternal kingdom. You're not going to have a part of me if you don't let me do this. The message is this. Without intimacy and vulnerability, we have no part of God. Foot washing involves two things. Intimacy and vulnerability. Intimacy is shown in the fact that you have to get incredibly close to somebody to wash their feet. It's not like when you're a kid and you've been running around in the, in the mud and everything and your dad makes you stand out in the yard and sprays you down with a hose. I mean, that, that's not foot washing. That's not, that's not the act of service that Jesus was doing here. You have to get close to somebody to wash their feet. Raise your hand if you'd be embarrassed today to have somebody wash your feet. Okay, I was about to say, I'm the only person. I don't want anybody washing my I have like hobbit feet. Like they're long and they are hairy and they're amazing. But when I walk, roses bloom behind me. So <laughs> Rainbows. We wear socks and shoes. And we don't want people touching our feet. Imagine if you had no shoes and you're walking around in the first century world. When you wash somebody's feet, you see an unflattering side of them. To wash somebody's feet, you have to get close enough to smell the stuff that's on their feet. To see the stuff. To touch it and feel the grime in your very hands. You see the unflattering side of a person. You see if they have hair on their feet. You see the calluses and bunions. You see if they have weird toes pointing in weird directions or whatever else. I mean, you see, it's not a glamorous thing. You cannot hide it from somebody when they're holding your feet. You have to get close and personal in a way with somebody to wash their feet. Intimate in a humbling way. Because there's an act of humility. I am considering myself to be less important than the grime on your feet that needs to be washed off. The other part, vulnerability, is shown by allowing somebody to get close enough to wash our feet. Allowing somebody to get close enough to see our unflattering side. Any of us have an unflattering side? You're having to open up to somebody. To trust that they're not going to laugh or harshly criticize. To be vulnerable and real and open and honest with somebody else. Intimacy is getting close enough to somebody. Vulnerability is letting somebody get close enough to you. So foot washing involves two things because it involves two people. One is being intimate. One is being vulnerable. And you have foot washing. Now, when we understand that, we can understand what Jesus was saying in verse 8, that without intimacy and vulnerability with God, we will have no part of God. 
It's not the actual foot washing. If you don't have your feet washed, you're not going to go to heaven. It is the message behind foot washing. It's what it takes to wash someone's feet that Jesus is saying we have to have. We have to be intimate with God. We have to be vulnerable with God. You can't know God without being intimate with him. We have to learn God's voice through deep prayer and scripture reading. Do you realize that? You, when you become born again, God doesn't just make it to where you can immediately understand everything that God's saying or, or hear him at a moment because we have a, a whole bunch of other noise in our life. We have a whole bunch of noise in our life from everybody around us, from all the expectations, from all the entertainment. You know, we don't go anywhere without some kind of noise going on. Some people, if you have three seconds to breathe, you're watching something on your smartphone. We have so much noise going on. We have to learn to hear God's voice. Elijah, when he was in the, the cave, there was an earthquake and there was thunder and there was everything going on. And Elijah knew that God's voice was not in loud, big thunderous signs but it was in the whisper of the wind we have to get close enough to God we have to be intimate with God we have to get close enough to hear God's whispers we have to seek God's character by listening to him and by being open to his challenge we have to be open to God disciplining us do you know that it says in Hebrews that God disciplines those that he loves when we refuse to allow God to nudge us back on the right path, we refuse God's love. Some preachers make it sound like once you're saved, God doesn't care what you do. God disciplines those that he loves. When we walk off of the path of righteousness, God does what he can at first gently and then sometimes more forcefully to try to get us back on the right path. We have to seek out a true relationship with God, deep prayer, listening to God, desiring to love God and to feel his love. Do you all understand what I mean by being intimate with God? But you also can't know God without being vulnerable with God. See, God invites us into his presence. God invites us. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant at the, on the top of it was what was called the mercy seat. And Hebrews in the, in the New Testament talks about the mercy seat. God invites us into the mercy seat, into the place of his presence, because God wants above all else to love us and to know us deeply and for us to know him deeply. So God invites, but there's another part of it, and it is the vulnerability aspect of it. A relationship with God cannot be one-sided. We have to be willing to be honest with God. To confess our sins. To confess our bad decisions. To confess our faults. We have to be willing to lay bare who we actually are and present it to God so that God can work in us. If you approach God and say, Lord, let me tell you how the other person in this conversation is entirely wrong and you tell me that I'm right, Lord. Guess what? You're not going to hear much from God if that's what you're approaching God to hear. Tell me what I already want to hear, God, and then it will be good. We have to be open to God. You know, one of the things about vulnerability, why we hate to be vulnerable in society, is because to be vulnerable, you allow yourself the possibility of being hurt. Which is why when you're dating, you put on the best image possible so you can surprise the snot out of the person when you get married. Right? Man, this person's amazing. And you get married, what is wrong with you? <laughs> we hate to be vulnerable. But we have to be open to God. We have to expose our pains and our wounds to God. We have to be willing to lay bare what, who we actually are and trust that God is a healer rather than one who inflicts pain. 
We have to realize that God is not a man. God is not motivated by human motivations. And God will not treat us as another human will treat us. When we are vulnerable with God, God seeks to heal what is broken. God does not stick his finger in the wound and make it hurt more. But we have to trust that God will keep his word. And he does. We have to be willing to strip away our image, to take off the masks, to take off the way that we perform in society all the time as if everything's okay. We have to be willing to say to God and to show who we really are and say, Lord, I am not okay. And I'm not pretty and I'm messed up. And I, you know, but Lord, here I am, warts and all. What do you want from me, Lord? Change me, God. Heal me. Without intimacy and vulnerability, our prayers, our scripture reading, and our church attendance will be dry and empty. I've known people who went to church for a while, and they dropped out because they said they never got anything out of it. And they stopped praying because they felt like they never heard anything. And they stopped reading scripture because nothing ever, it just never captivated them. If you approach all the aspects of being a Christian without ever being willing to be intimate and vulnerable with God, then you're not going to get anything. Lord, I will give you my needs because I want you to to supply me with what I need physically, but I'm not going to give you my heart. Okay, well then there's only so much that's going to happen in your faith. Jesus goes further in verse 15 and says that we have to do this with others. So we have to understand that without intimacy and vulnerability with others, we will have no part of God. The first part of this, most people go, you know what, that makes sense. I need to be intimate and vulnerable with God. This part, people start like fiddling and making nooses and stuff to lynch the pastor because... This is the part we don't like. Jesus said we have to serve others. How can you serve somebody if you don't know them? You know, there's some general things that we can do to serve other people. We can, you know, we can supply some very general needs. But in, you can't even just buy some groceries and drop it off at a stranger's house. What if they're lactose intolerant? What if they have a gluten allergy? What if they're diabetic? Well, if I shopped for some stranger the way I shop for myself, they would have a diabetic coma. I can't just drop off groceries at somebody's house because I don't know them. I don't know their needs. How can we serve others in specific ways without specifically knowing their wants and needs? We can't take baby formula and just go to someone's house and drop it off. What if they're 80 years old and there's no baby in the house? Now, people have very lovingly dropped off food and diapers at our house because they know who we are and they know that we need diapers. But you can't just distribute diapers to everybody in society. I mean, that should be the next government aid program. Diapers for everybody. I mean, you can't do that because you have to know people's specific needs. You have to build true and intimate relationships with people inside the church and outside the church because serving others involves intimacy and vulnerability. Have you taken the time, have we taken the time to get to know everybody that walks in the doors of this church? You know, there's somebody I don't really know who's... who's you know, come for a couple of weeks, and I hope somebody takes them out to lunch. Well, why don't you take them out to lunch? Well, you know, I, I'm, I cooked this lasagna, and I cooked it for 16 people. I don't know why, but that's what the recipe did, so I need some extra people to come over. Why don't you call somebody that you don't really know, get to know them? We struggle with this. Have we invited people 
into our homes to truly build relationships with them? Do you know? Take a look at the person to your left and right. Do you know what makes them cry? Do you have any clue what the last thing they cried about was? Now, if the person to your right's a man, they never cry, so it's okay. Jesus didn't cry either, several, several times in Scripture. Do you know what makes the people to your left and right rejoice? Do you know what makes them go, thank you, God? I feel like this burden has just been taken off of me. Do you know the scars and the victory medals of every person in this church? Because every person in this church has been through battles. And some have been lost and some have been won. Do you know the scars and the stories and the victory medals? What about the teenagers? The teenagers associated with this church, if you are not a teenager, do you have any clue what grieves them, what their hopes and dreams are? The church confirms God's calling in people's lives. God calls and the church confirms it. How can the church confirm when young people are called into some kind of ministry if the church doesn't know the person? What about the pastors? Do you know what makes me and Pastor Emmett grieve? Do you know what keeps us up at night besides babies? That's an easy answer for us. Do you know what worries I have about the future, even though Philippians 4, 7 says, do not be anxious? Do you know why I struggle sometimes with that verse? Have you taken the time to have intimacy in your marriages? And I don't just mean like sexual intimacy. I mean actual intimacy where a husband and a wife actually open up with each other and be vulnerable, knowing that the other person is not there to hurt, but the other person is there to strengthen and support. To be Christ-like in our marriages, we have to be vulnerable. We have to be intimate. But what we want to do, because we have a sinful nature, is this. Them first. When my spouse is open and vulnerable with me, then I will be open and vulnerable with them. When somebody from the church reaches out to me, then I will reciprocate and I will invite them back. If somebody else does this first, then I will do this. Well, in that encounter in Scripture, who was the first to wash the feet? Jesus didn't go, come on, Peter, I'm waiting on you. Instead of waiting for somebody else to move first, we have to be like Christ. If you want church to really be a family, we cannot wait on other people to make it a family. We have to be the ones to say, I will be as God has called me to be and begin to reach out and form relationships of intimacy and vulnerability. When we look at the people in the community, people will listen to you much more if you want to tell them about Jesus or invite them into church, if you have formed a relationship with them. Churches sometimes have that you first mentality where we are waiting for those who don't know Jesus to walk in the door and then we will love them. Do you know how many churches there are in America? If people were waiting for an open church door to go to church, <laughs> all the churches would be filled. They're waiting for people to form relationships and to live out the love of Jesus Christ. Listen again to Jesus. Without intimacy and vulnerability with God and with others, we will have no part of God. That's difficult, isn't it? Look at this verse from 1 John. You can look back later and read the whole verse. 
For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. But Lord, I love you with all my, all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then love your neighbor as yourself. We cannot say to God whom we have not seen that I love you with all that I am when we refuse to love our brothers and sisters and those that don't know Jesus with all that we are. If you build a barrier in the church, you're building a barrier between you and God. If you're building a barrier between people, you are blocking yourself from experiencing all that God has for you. He who does not love his brother whom he has not seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. We cannot be with God without intimacy and vulnerability with him. We cannot be with God without intimacy and vulnerability with others. We have to be willing to open ourselves up to be honest and flawed and to begin to have intimacy and vulnerability in the church. Amen? Are we doing our part? Are we being people of intimacy and vulnerability? When we have intimacy and vulnerability with God and intimacy and vulnerability with others, then the Holy Spirit finds fertile soil in our hearts to bring about the works of God in our lives. Because otherwise, God has to spend his energy and effort into breaking down the barriers that we build up instead of growing the character of God in us. Where are you at? Have you been building walls? Or have you been building relationships? Are you like Peter? <laughs> no, Lord. I'll skip this one. Thanks. Or are you like Peter the second time? Fine. If that's what it takes, wash all of me. I don't care. Are you building walls? Or are you building relationships? Are you being vulnerable and intimate with God? Or are you keeping a distance? Let's be people that do not live our lives controlled by fear of being hurt by others, but let's be people who are willing to be intimate and vulnerable.